Thanks everyone for being here this afternoon. Allow me to share some of our insights about enhanced recovery by minimizing opioid use. Relevant disclosures are shown in this slide. Take a look at this photo. This was in the news in Ohio. See the kid in the back seat? The opioid problem is a real problem. At least one fatal over over overdose happens per day. And uh, we've, we've made great efforts in the state of Ohio, as many other states have, to try and tackle this. Uh, we had um, one of the uh, federal, uh, a federal lawyer uh, speak to us about it at our endocarditis meeting a couple weeks ago. Despite handing out 600,000 needles in needle exchange programs uh, and other efforts like limiting opioid prescriptions to seven days in our state, we continue to see this be a problem. But we have other changes happening in, in the way we deliver health care. So, you know, we're shifting to value. And some of the things we have to think about more than ever before are patient experience and, and other ways of limiting cost and, and combining what we do. Uh, we are developing bundles for, for care. We already uh, apply a bundle uh, process to our coronary bypass surgery. We're doing the same for our isolated valves in our institution. And all of you know that we're being measured by an increasing number of quality metrics in our institutions every day. So when it comes to measuring things, we have to measure pain. And we measure pain as a real vital sign in our institution. What is pain? Pain is what the patient says it is and where it exists where they say it is. It's a subjective thing and yet we're asked to address it objectively. In this study where they looked at a sample of 1,500 surgical patients, they concluded that post-operative pain treatment was unsatisfactory. And we know that there are other consequences of pain. It drives our sympathetic system, it creates tachypnea and hypertension, which can be associated with other complications and worse outcomes. Uh, I can tell you in some of the patients where I'm forced to make really big incisions, if we don't get them breathing and coughing, they end up with a whole lot of other complex complications, and I see it all the time. This study, which was just published, showed that we may be contributing to the problem. In this study, they looked at over 18,000 patients undergoing more than 21,000 operations, and they assessed how much opioid medication they were taking in the hospital on the last day before discharge. And despite the fact that a third of the patients were taking no opioids for that 24-hour period prior to discharge, almost half of that subset still received a prescription for opioid meds. Are we contributing? Maybe. but. Um, Certainly, it's not all our fault. It's easy to point at us doctors, but we still have to take ownership of this problem. And I think the way that we can do this is by focusing on reducing the use of opioids or improving the way that we treat pain across each of the phases of care, intraoperative, in the ICU, with and without the tube in, in those step-down units, and after we get the patients home. And I'll talk about some of the methods that we've used. Intraoperative pain options include sort of global options. Uh, epidural injections work great for our thoracic surgery patients, not really uh, much of an option in our cardiac patients, although I visited a unit in Italy where they put a high epidural in all of their valve patients and they get them out of the hospital in three days. You have to have an anesthesiologist that's excited about putting those high epidurals in. Some of the unilateral uh, local methods I think are underutilized and we are exploring this. There's a paucity of data. Uh, but I will share with you some of those that I think have a lot of potential. So this is a really great uh, picture on the left, an illustration, but it comes from a case report. Uh, and our um, acute pain management team has paired up with our intraoperative pain management teams to help them utilize some of these uh, better local anesthetic techniques. You can see this is a picture from a patient I did a mini right thoracotomy AVR on just a few weeks ago, and my anesthesia colleague was using ultrasound guidance to deliver the, pain, uh, deliver the needle, to deliver that long-acting local anesthetic where it matters to the nerve directly. That case report is one about a patient who had a sternotomy, and they're delivering it to those intercostal nerves. It takes a little bit more time in the operating room, but I don't think that this kind of procedure is going to prolong our OR time. Certainly, we'll see it come back to us if we can get these patients mobilized sooner. Cryoanalgesia is another option. Uh, the um, cryoanalgesic uh, probes are commercially approved for this kind of treatment. The, uh, in summary, what they do is they destroy the axon while maintaining the, uh, the life 
of the uh, tubule structure, the neural sheath. And so if you just kill the axon, you numb the nerve temporarily, and that axon will grow back over a period of a couple of months. I use it all the time when I do these gigantic incisions in my thoracoabdominal patients. And I've seen it really make a big difference in these people because I can get them up, get them breathing, get them coughing, get them mobilized, and, it's re and I've seen it reduce the length of stay in these patients. And what we'll do is we'll use the cryoprobe. It has to be below 50 degrees, uh, ne negative 50 degrees Celsius to get an adequate uh, destruction of the axon, but not too cold so it doesn't destroy the sheath and we'll take out the intercostals uh, at the level of the incision and then two above and two below. They also recommend that you don't go below level nine because it, that nerve doesn't grow back very well and you can get chronic thoracotomy pain. Something to think about certainly for big incisions and I know a lot of folks uh, have explored using this in smaller thoracotomy incisions as well, uh, but the probe isn't cheap. What about when we get the patient out of the operating room? Oh, let me just step back a, uh, a step. I didn't uh, put anything about the sternal plating because I knew we were going to hear a lot about it from Mark. <laughs> um, uh, but we have increasingly been using the sternal plating systems, and I think it makes a lot of sense. I think it's an area that's ripe for, um, for study. Uh, and uh, address the question from Frank um, from Detroit uh, about the bulky uh, things. There is a new device from Jace. It's a low profile plating system that works really nice in the skinny patients. It's a really easy to use system. Um, uh, and we've been using that uh, more often in our patients. I think we can stabilize and get a better fixation. That's also an intraoperative technique that's important. Once we get the patients to the ICU, uh, we do use a combination of various uh, uh, drugs. Um, we do use uh, opioids, of course, early. We try to begin our PCA pump early. Uh, we do have um, uh, multimodality infusions, uh, including uh, uh, propofol. There is some evidence that ketamine might be able to reduce some of the narcotic consumption, and we try to um, uh, give NSAIDs or acetaminophen as early as possible uh, as that multimodal therapy. And we place lidocaine patches on the skin alongside the incision. How much of a difference that really makes, I don't know, but the patients can see the thing there, and it may, it may offer an important placebo. They sure like their patches oftentimes. Once the patient's extubated, we try, and we try to get them extubated as soon as possible. Our goal is always less than four hours post-op. We have a subset of patients who we will get them extubated in the operating room. But we get that multimodal an uh, analgesia started right away. Again, this, uh, this list uh, is very similar to the list I showed on the last slide. But now that the patients are extubated, uh, we, have a, a, um, we offer them some of these other healing services. You know, some of the guys, you talk to them about Reiki and massage and they laugh at you and send the patients away, but many of the patients will actually welcome that. And you can't tell by the way a patient looks uh, about the way that they'll be responsive to that kind of uh, um, complementary therapy. Uh, and we get the patients mobilized as soon as possible. Once we get them out of the ICU and their step-down units, we do our best, we, the best we can to try and get them switched over from intravenous to uh, oral medications. Uh, and again, including acetaminophen and NSAIDs where applicable. We try to limit the amount of narcotics. And uh, there's a growing body of data that suggests that some of these anticonvulsant therapies like gabapentin might make a big difference and reduce some of the need for opioids. Uh, but we don't have a problem giving them an IV PCA for breakthrough pain, but we include our pain management team in that process. Our nurses ha have a really important role in being the champions for pain management for our patients because they're there at the bedside. Uh, there's local anesthetic patches. Again, we continue along with the healing surfaces. And we have our cardiothoracic anesthesia and their NPs that, that work in both our ICUs and on the floor round on a daily basis to help tailor the, the regimen for these patients. So it's a, a something that we're constantly managing. And then when we send the patients home, uh, we're only allowed to give them that one week supply for the narcotics, but we see them in the outpatient clinic and reassess their pain. We continue that uh, plan with multimodal therapy, again, with the oral meds that I described. Uh, we'll send them home with the local anesthetic patches. Certainly, if they felt that they were beneficial in the hospital, we definitely give them, give them those to take home with them. And we educate them about pain. They need to know that they may not be completely pain-free, but it needs to be tolerable enough to allow them to do the things that they need to do to get better, like cough and breathe and be active and functional. And we have access for them with a phone with 24-hour uh, management for um, nurses on call, as well as website. And now we have also virtual 
virtual options for them to speak face to face with someone with a, a FaceTime kind of um, option. And what I don't have on this list, which also, also I think is critically important, is we get them in a bowel regimen plan early on in the hospital and we stress the importance of that post-operatively because they are going to have some narcotics and you know if that if they get behind in that then, then it creates really a, a, a bit of a spiral of a problem. So what about these uh, multimodal analgesia options? Again, there's, there's quite a list here. Um, the NSAIDs and acetaminophen are at the top of the list, the things that most, are most commonly used. I think we're learning more about gabapentin. Um, clonidine is an interesting thing that can make a big difference. Uh, and uh, locals, cannabinoids, well, that's all just been approved in Ohio, so I don't know if we're going to go there, but I think that's an area ripe for study. Um, there is some early data that's suggesting cannabinoids may help uh, in some of the states that have had them available. If we look specifically at IV acetaminophen and look at the pharmacokinetics of it, the reason why it's better than the oral acetaminophen is twofold. One, because we see that the plasma concentration peaks really early, but more importantly, uh, we see the CSF concentration not only peaks early, but is maintained uh, through, uh, through that initial period. So if we get the pain treated sooner, uh, we can manage it better. We don't want to get uh, behind on patients' pain management. This is a study that looked at uh, cardiac surgery uh, uh, patients, um, or actually looked at a huge uh, group of encounters in many hospitals, but um, uh, they also focused on cardiac surgery patients. And they found that the use of IV acetaminophen uh, reduced the length of stay by a day and uh, it maybe reduced the complication rate. That was a trend. I don't think that that was clinically significant. This is a study that was just published in JAMA Surgery this year where they did a randomized controlled trial of giving patients gabapentin, 1,200 milligrams pre-op and then 600 milligrams three times a day for 72 hours versus placebo in patients undergoing um, a whole bunch of different kind of operations including thora a thoracotomy and VATS procedures which is relevant to us as well as orthopedic and general surgery operations. They found that there was no d difference in the adverse events in these two groups. Specifically, confusion and delirium wasn't affected by the use of that gabapentin, but a 24% um, percent increased rate of opioid cessation after surgery. So remember that study I showed you earlier and the people that, there was a group of people, about a third of people in that study who weren't taking any opioids at the time of discharge. That's what we want to get. We want to, we want to increase the number of people that don't need any opioids at all. And so our goals for our patients when it comes to treating their pain and taking care of their problems is to make sure that they're comfortable. Pain-free recovery sounds great, but I think pain-tolerable recovery is, is certainly where we need to start when they're leaving the hospital and we need to teach them about what to expect. Getting them mobilized early and improving their quality of life are our main goals, and hopefully by doing so, we can improve patient satisfaction and reduce costs. These are the, these are the uh, uh, consensus recommendations from our group about this idea of multimodal opioid sparing and pain management, and we'll talk more about this in our program on Tuesday, and we'll have a paper out soon. Thank you very much.